All righty. So thanks for coming out. Um, like John said, I've been working in um, upstream Docker open source for um, kind of the f since the early days of, of Docker getting popular in 2014, summer of 2014, I guess. The real, real early people were 2013, you know, in the zero dot X releases of Docker. But anyway, I've been, I've been around that community for a long time. Um, and so one of the things I've talked to John about and he thought it might be a useful talk for this audience is just to kind of see where Docker's gone in that four year span uh, from um, being kind of this monolithic single Docker engine binary to a bunch of open source projects that all interrelate. And so that's kind of uh, what I'll take you through tonight. Uh, like John said, um, I'm a d distinguished engineer with IBM Cloud. Um, I'm part of uh, Docker's captain uh, community, which is sort of experts and, and those who blog and write and speak about Docker. Um, who, kn who knows what Moby project means? Does that mean anything to a few of you, a few of you? So we'll talk about that a little bit, but Docker about a year and a half ago um, kind of tried to split the Docker product from the Docker open source world, and that's called the Moby project. Uh, so I'm a maintainer in that and also container D, which we'll talk about, and sit on a few of the steering committees and boards of, of the foundations around all that. So um, I have been at IBM my whole career, so I'm one of those kind of crazy lifer IBM or people, uh, which makes it very weird to work upstream with all these like young SF, you know, VC funded startup people who change jobs every couple of years. So uh, somehow I've stuck around IBM a long time and done a lot with Linux before my days in the cloud unit. Um, so I've been around open source for a long time. Um, so let's jump in. Uh, I'm going to start uh, and just talk about something. Hopefully, if you've come to a Docker meetup, you know something about, you know what the Docker engine is. Uh, if you don't, uh, we can, in the Q&A, we can even go back a little and make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, but in the early days, 2013, 2014, there was simply this binary that you put in your, and I'm talking Linux because this is before there was Windows containers and Windows, uh, a Docker binary for Windows. But in the early days, you just had the single binary that had everything. It had the Docker client, it had the Docker build tool, it had the Docker daemon, it had the client that talked to a registry like Docker Hub to pull images or push images. Um, and so, you know, to be honest, I think uh, this was one of the reasons Docker took off compared to a lot of other things that were out there, uh, Cloud Foundry or OpenStack or other, and those aren't all obviously the same concept as Docker, but to think about taking a single binary, putting it on a system, and now I can do all these things. I can Docker run Ubuntu, and I can build images, and I can push and pull. That was pretty powerful, especially for developers. And tons of people got very excited about Docker again in that 2013-2014 era. Um, and again, the simplicity of, of both the user experience, you know, these commands made sense, they were simple, uh, versus some other container technology that was around at the time. Uh, this was just way simpler to use and people loved it. Fast forward all the way to today, and Docker is a, quite a few different binaries. There's a daemon, there's the actual client itself that's still called Docker. There's a project container D underneath that, which again, I'll talk through each of those, each of these as we kind of walk down the stack. Um, there's run C, which is another project that came out of that original Docker binary. Um, the, again, I'll explain what that is. And then over the years, Docker added ways to expand Docker's functionality with plugins like volume plugins or networking plugins. And so as you can see, in the four years, uh, Docker has grown quite a bit as far as um, e even some of the, a, a bit more of a complicated model uh, than it was back in 2013, 2014. And we'll kind of look at why that happened, what these pieces are, and, and how they fit together. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about the Open Container Initiative. So that's what OCI stands for, and Run C, which is that binary I showed kind of at the very bottom of this stack of components. Um, 
So this, uh, I didn't put time frames on a lot of this. Actually, I think if I go to this slide. So yeah, summer of 2015, um, the founder of Docker, Solomon Hike, stood up on stage. This was the week of DockerCon that year. And uh, this is six months after uh, CoreOS had announced a somewhat competitive um, container runtime to Docker called Rocket. Anyone heard of Rocket? Anyone? A few of you. Um, so this is six months after that, there were some tensions. The CoreOS people had been involved in the Docker open source project. I had worked with some of them in the early days in 2014. But they kind of wanted Docker to do some things that Docker didn't want to do. And so they ended up announcing their own runtime called Rocket. And so uh, quite a few vendors, including IBM, went privately to CoreOS and Docker and Red Hat and Google and, and others and said, this is, this is not a good deal if we end up with a container industry with a bunch of different runtimes that work, use different image styles, you know, use different ways to start and stop containers. And so uh, this week of DockerCon, the Open Container Initiative was announced. Um, I think this number is still kind of correct, 44 member companies. Actually, I believe it's higher now. Uh, but a lot of people have gotten on board in the last few years with this idea that we should have one place, not controlled by Docker, not by CoreOS, not by Google, um, one place where we all agree what is a container and what is a container image. And this year, we're actually expanding that to include um, how do you talk to a container registry. So Docker. Docker's registry is kind of the de facto standard. Uh, when you talk to Google's container registry or Red Hat's or um, VMware has a container registry, they all operate on the Docker API, but now we're gonna put that as part of the OCI. So again, standardizing the basic things that we all do with containers so that uh, even if people have different implementations, we can all agree on how they interoperate. Um, so this was started underneath the Linux Foundation, again, free from control by any one vendor. And it came not just with a specification, but actually Run C was the first implementation of the runtime spec. Um, Docker, around the time that I started working with the project, had created this, this smaller project within Docker called libcontainer. And it was just a basic API for how um, at this point, Go language code could actually invoke a Linux system to start a container, like all the pieces that, that happen when you start a container. Uh, libcontainer kind of encapsulated all that in a nice, easy to use API. And so Run C became this first client of libcontainer, and all that code was taken out of Docker, given to the OCI, and a bunch of uh, contributing vendors all worked together to bring that to life. And both the specification, and we'll talk a bit about Run C, it hasn't officially reached 1.0, but since June of last year, um, we've all, again, in, within the OCI agreed on what a container is, what a container image is, and those specs are available. You can go look at them, download them, uh, read them, um, and, and we'll see that there's many implementations now using that. Uh, if you think about what, um, the OCI really means. There's two pieces of information necessary to start a container. One is a bunch of information about what to do. Like if you think about a Docker file, if you've written a Docker file, there's a command that actually gets run when Docker starts the container. Uh, but then there's also a file system of contents. So uh, if I say Docker run and then this Alpine is the name of a, a very tiny, um, Linux distribution, Docker knows that's the image to use, and there's a bunch of information like what host amount, what command to run, the sh at the end there of this Docker run command. Um, all that gets encapsulated in the OCI in a JSON file called config.json, and then the file system, the actual contents of your image, uh, with those two pieces of information, run C can actually uh, run a container. So I think I, um, talk a little bit about that here. I mentioned libcontainer. Um, the scope of Run C is very limited, so it's it's never 
Run C is not something you're going to want to use in your daily job um, if you're dealing with containers. It doesn't handle networking. It doesn't talk to image registries. Uh, but it's a very important piece of the core under, with, under which a lot of runtimes uh, can, can then use it. But Run C is still an active community because this is where new features in Linux, uh, new capabilities around containers, as they come into Linux and the Linux kernel, then Run C enables those here so that tools like Docker can, can add them later. So there's things like ambient capabilities, which if you don't know what that is, that's fine, but it's, it's important to the security of containers. Uh, rootless containers, there's a bunch of work happening in Run C at that level. Uh, there's things changing around control groups in Linux kernel. Run C will have to support that. Um, so again, this is a very low level, probably not interesting to most developers, but it's, an, it's a very important key part of the overall ecosystem of containers and it's required uh, for a lot of the higher layer capabilities that you use in Docker. Um, yeah, and there's obviously some more facts up there. Run C is not quite at release 1.0, which we just discussed on the OCI call yesterday. Um, not that interesting probably, but there's, there's a lot of features that people are trying to get in before we do an official 1.0 release. So it's at release candidate five as of a few months ago. Um, so let me move up from Run C. So we've talked about this very low layer. Run C talks to Linux and actually runs your containers. Container D is one step above that. Um, and I, I put in quotes because, again, uh, with some um, potential uh, debates around the industry about Docker versus Kubernetes that showed up, again, as we moved forward into 2015 and 2016. Um, People were saying, hey, we, you know, Docker changes too fast. There's all these new features. We just need a boring base container runtime that everybody can rely on. And then Docker can build on that and Kubernetes can build on that. And so that was the idea when ContainerD was created. Um, and then just last year contributed to the CNCF, which is the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So let's talk a little bit about why this happened. Uh, again, I just mentioned some of that. Um, there were a lot of people wanting to use containers for all kinds of things, not just Docker. Um, who's used or, or played around or understand Kubernetes to any degree? OK, about half or a little more than half. So Kubernetes, uh, we'll talk about at the very end of the uh, presentation, is, is a container orchestrator. So think about running containers on many nodes of a, of a, a multi-system cluster. Um, Docker had a, uh, a uh, not a product, but a project called Swarm. So Docker included their own orchestration platform um, that came out a little after Kubernetes started. Um, and so again, some of these tensions in communities of, well, Docker is just doing things that benefit Swarm, but we need a container runtime that, that will work for Kubernetes and not be uh, filled with Docker's features for Swarm. And so Container D was sort of this agreement to have a lower layer, uh, unopinionated runtime that both Docker could build on and Docker Swarm could use, as well as Kubernetes. And then all these public clouds that are looking for a, uh, a runtime could also use it as well. Um, so Container D uh, has been around for a while. It was initially created in December 2015 and similar to Run C. Um, this was code that existed to some degree already in the Docker engine that was pulled out. Um, even today, we still have more work to do because Container D now has features that Docker has, uh, but there's two places in which that code is implemented. So Docker is actually working on removing more code from Docker and using the Container D implementation of that. So that's kind of why there's these two streams of activity. So in the early days, Container D had a very simple um, set of capabilities to just use Run C to start and stop and pause and unpause and kill your containers. So you can think of it kind of as a manager over top of Run C. When it was donated or uh, in December 2016 when the intention was, uh, okay, Container D is not going to be controlled by Docker. We're going to give it to a foundation, which later on was announced as the CNCF. Uh, 
Then container D had to have more features. It had to be able to talk to registries, which is something that didn't exist in this 0.2.x branch. So when we finally announced 1.0, it, it was basically something you could use as an alternative to Docker, although in a very limited way. Because again, container D is just uh, kind of a, a stable base under which a lot of Docker features operate. Um, yeah, we'll get into some of these some of these details. So effectively, uh, when I have Container D running on a system, I can interact with it over gRPC. So it has a socket that listens, and I can actually, as a very well defined API, uh, pull this image from Docker Hub. Okay, now start a container using this environment and this command. Um, I can also do that from a GoLang client library, but that's that's just because it's written in Go. We have both those ways are, are possible. What happens under the covers is that container D, once it has the metadata and the image content necessary to start a container, it can actually start a run C process on your system to actually execute that container. So when you tell Docker run an Alpine image and run the shell, uh, this SH shell, um, under the covers, once it assembles those layers into a file system, and it understands all the things you've asked for here and, and set those up in the configuration. It then calls run C and says, by the way, your OCI bundle with the configuration is here, and here's the file system. And run C uh, sets up the namespaces and C groups based on this configuration. And then it fork execs that bin SH. So you won't see run C after that 300 milliseconds that process is gone. It's now parented by container D, actually. Oh. Okay. And actually, uh, this may go a little too, but it's actually parented by a shim process, which has its own API. So in case that process dies, container D can still do some management, like, oh, let's clean up that container that died. So there's actually even a pro we We'll be able to see that process in PS. But run C is only there for a brief moment. So there's not much else I want to say here. Container D, the nice thing we were able to do when we built Container D as a separate project is really rethink. So again, Docker moved so fast in that 2013, 2014, 2015 era, and the code base got huge as more and more features came in. We were able to think through how to make Container D sim as, as simple as possible and, and let Docker handle. There's definitely complexity to dealing with all kinds of types of volumes and networks, but we didn't have to deal with that in Container D. And so we really have some very simple concepts, and they're all very separate services within Container D, like the metadata content. Snapshotter is our word for uh, back-end file system drivers. So if you've played around with Docker configuration and used Overlay or Device Mapper or uh, AUFS on Ubuntu, uh, we have the same concept in Container D called snapshotters. Um, so again, the, the nice thing is that the design of Container D is, is easy to under, understand and easy to use, and hopefully, uh, we believe, better performing, more stable, uh, because of this focus on just a nice, clean implementation. Um, so let's try and put it all together. Uh, I said early on that the Moby project was Docker's uh, intention of kind of separating out their concerns of having a open source product. Uh, so the Docker kind of free community edition um, from the actual open source projects that, that build into that. And so you may have never heard of some of these down here, Notary, DataKit, VPN Kit, HyperKit, Maybe you've used Docker Compose. Uh, you've probably used a registry or at least probably Docker's registry. But these are all pieces. Um, and then there's some kits, Swarm Kit, Linux Kit. These are all pieces of what becomes the full Docker uh, product. Um, and they have obviously an enterprise product as well as a free product. And so Moby Project kind of became this umbrella over everything that's just pure open source. Uh, to hopefully separate that out and, again, deal with some of the concerns people had with Docker's product versus open source projects. Um, and so if we think about this picture from today, um, I have on the right 
And the, this is not exhaustive. There were a lot of other projects we just saw on that slide before. But if we think about all the basic big blocks of this, we can see there's a bunch of different open source GitHub projects here from the Docker client, which is now separate, as I said, from the Docker daemon. Um, and that stayed uh, in Docker's namespace, so, so github.com slash Docker. And that's because the Docker client is really their value add to the container ecosystem. Like if you like Docker, like their client has their way of doing features, um, but the actual engine itself is Moby slash Moby. And again, this is that separation of the Moby project from the Docker uh, product. And so that, that comprises the Docker daemon and all the plugins. Then the Container D project, which again is part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So again, that's not owned by Docker, but that's Docker's heavily involved as are uh, quite a few other vendors. And then Run C is part of the OCI, so Open Container slash Run C. And if you ever want to see how all these pieces fit together, you can look at the Docker slash Docker hyphen CE project. And that's where they actually specify, okay, the Docker 18.06 release is going to be made up of this hash of the client and this version of Moby Moby, and we're going to grab Containerd 1.x, um, and all those get assembled into a Docker CE release uh, for the community edition. And then, of course, Docker, the company, uh, takes all that and packages their enterprise product with their enterprise edition add-ons for that. So that's kind of how Docker uh, today um, maps to, to the open source side of the world. Uh, but I thought it'd be also interesting to see, okay, so great, Docker split a bunch of these projects around. They, they made some uh, as donations to other foundations. Does anybody else use those pieces or was it just kind of a big show to, to kind of uh, quell a bunch of concerns? So it's interesting to see that the OCI has actually generated quite a bit of activity outside of Docker. You probably haven't heard of Cycle.io. Um, it's a startup um, that uh, has a nice container as a service cloud platform. You can actually, they just refreshed it. I think they're just kind of announced a big 2.0 release. Um, and instead of building it around Docker, or around Containerd, they actually built their entire platform around Run C. And so they built, obviously, their own platform around that that knows how to uh, pull images from a registry and set them up in the right way so Run C can use them. Um, but they have agreements with Packet.net, which is a, a cloud provider. And you can actually provision hardware you can load the cycle um, uh, infrastructure layer on there, and you can have a nice GUI for deploying containers across uh, a suite of servers in the cloud. Um, and so again, that's all built on top of Run C. Like they, they need nothing else. They don't use Docker, they don't use Container D. So that's an interesting uh, project, and I've talked to the founders a few times. Um, uh, and they actually have a healthy set of uh, customers that they're happy with and they're continuing to grow. Um, so that's an interesting use case of, you know, breaking out the OCI and Run C allowed them to innovate on their own without any ties to any of the other pieces of the container uh, ecosystem. They don't use Kubernetes, they built their own orchestration layer. Uh, Creo, uh, I think you mentioned a few minutes ago, came out of uh, Red Hat. Um, a lot of the people working on Creo worked with me in the Docker community way back in the early days. And uh, I think the easiest way to, to, to say this is that Red Hat and Docker didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And so instead of joining us in the Containerd community, Creo is very similar to Containerd. Is they kind of sit at the same layer of the stack. They use Run C. They're available to be used by Kubernetes. In fact, Creo is meant to be only used by Kubernetes as a, a CRI, the Container Runtime Interface. That's how the name uh, Creo came about. So Kubernetes, we're going to see a picture in a minute, but um, can use any runtime that implements the CRI. And so Creo is Red Hat's offering. They use it in their OpenShift product uh, as the runtime, or at least they're moving their customers to use Creo. It's available in their recent releases of OpenShift. 
uh, not just in tech preview anymore. I think it's officially GA. Um, so again, they use Run C directly. They built their own stack on top of that that manages Run C similar to how Container D does. Um, and so again, they're use they have people active in the OCI. Uh, Red Hat does, uh, including uh, a good friend of mine, Vincent Batts, who's driven a lot of the initial um, work to get to 1.0 for the, both the spec and Run C. Um, some of these spec implementers you may never have heard of, you may have um, hyper.sh. Uh, who's heard of lightweight virtualization in, in just a couple of you? So containers contain using Linux kernel features, right? These namespaces and C groups. Um, but a couple of these entries, in fact, the top two, um, some companies said, well, if I run untrusted code in my container, I'm not sure I really want to rely on Linux kernel um, isolation. I'd actually like the protection of a VM, of a virtual machine. But I still like how containers work. I like the simplicity of Docker run and Docker push and pull. And so hyper.sh was a, a startup that created a implementation of the OCI so you could actually tell your Docker daemon don't use run C, go use hyper.sh's run V. I think they called their binary run V. And you could use all the Docker commands, but behind the scenes, hyper.sh was running your container inside a VM uh, in a very lightweight way, not, not traditional VM like minutes of boot time. It was actually very fast. Intel did something very similar called clear containers. Those two groups have now come together under a foundation, actually the OpenStack Foundation, and the project is no, now called Cata Containers. And the interesting thing is they're now involved with us in the Container D community and Creo. So both Creo and Container D can run lightweight virtualized uh, containers. But again, this, uh, in case I've talked too long, the intent of this slide is to show that the OCI actually was valuable and that people could go off and do interesting things. Uh, without sort of modifying the higher layers of the stack. Like Docker can still do Docker things, and they just implement that OCI spec. Uh, in the high performance computing space, so the big national labs, uh, they have a runtime called Singularity. I've been talking to some of that uh, team recently um, about the OCI because they were initially not very interested in being OCI compatible. Uh, but their recent release actually does have some OCI compatibility. And this is good news for the HPC space would like some of the same features as Docker, but they have very, very different hardware and requirements. Um, so this is some interesting ongoing work of how the OCI can help make sure that we're all interoperable, no matter if you're in the enterprise side or high performance computing. And there's other projects. Uh, IBM had one called RunQ that was with our power hardware and our Z mainframes. Uh, GVisor, has anyone ever heard of that from Google? So GVisor is an implementation of the kernel in user space. And if that makes no sense, you can just ignore it. Uh, but it's an interesting idea, again, about security, about securing containers in a different way than the default kind of Linux kernel namespaces. Um, yeah, so they haven't shown much interest, and I've talked to the guys at Canonical. Um, LXC, they feel like they have their own kind of branding around running system containers, which is what they, so uh, Docker, the Docker world, we tend to, to run a single application in a container. You run a web server, you run Redis, you run a cache. Um, LXC and, and LXD are from Canonical, the company that makes Ubuntu. Um, they can run a whole distro inside of a container. I mean, you could do that with Docker too, but they've patterned LXC to actually do that very, very well. And so uh, the OCI spec um, could be used for that, but the, they're, it's kind of a different model and they've been fine just being their own thing for now. Yes. Um, yeah, Podman's fairly new. I haven't put it anywhere on these slides, but um, 
This is also a Red Hat project for everyone else in the room that effectively works like the Docker command line. So if you can do Docker pull, you can do Podman pull. If you can do Docker run, you can do Podman run. But it uses cryo under the covers, not container D. Um, and again, in their world of OpenShift, uh, for their customer set, when they take out Docker and put cryo, there's this missing piece. I, you know, maybe a system administrator still wants to do Docker run, so Podman is their replacement for that Docker command line experience when Creo is the main system runtime. Yes, yeah, because the OCI is effectively, the spec is defined based on Linux kernel features. So those communities work together. If there's a new feature in the Linux kernel, then OCI community says, oh, we need to add something in the spec about. So just, I don't know if anyone, anyone care about the high performance computing space or involved in any way? Probably not. I don't think we have any big national labs in Virginia, um, or at least not in this area. Uh, but it's interesting, to your point, uh, high performance computing cares a ton about GPUs, TPUs, special device pass-throughs, because they have these huge you know, labs filled with uh, very tightly interconnected specialized hardware. And so one of the things that OCI is trying to resolve is maybe defining better how device pass-through works for the high-performance computing community. Because one of the reasons Singularity was created was because they felt Docker and the OCI were missing features that they needed in that community. This is my bread and butter. I work on Container D, so this is my chance to rah-rah Container D. We're doing great. We have lots. Of, so uh, not that Creo is really a competitor, because it actually gets very weird, because my company just announced buying Red Hat. So uh, the Creo team has already reached out to me, like, hey, when are we going to have an arm wrestling tournament? Like, <laughs> see who wins, Container D or Creo. But we're all going to be one happy family sometime next year. Uh, anyway, Container D. Uh, part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We're actually uh, approaching going for graduation in the CNCF community. So the CNCF has an umbrella over many projects, including Kubernetes as part of the CNCF. And one of the steps in being a project is to graduate uh, from incubation to being a fully graduated project. So I just copied this directly out of our graduation uh, proposal, which we're working on right now. Um, so because Containerd is used by the Docker engine, it's very easy to claim that we have millions and millions of users because Docker tells us that the Docker for Mac product has been downloaded millions and millions of times. Um, and so every instance of a Docker engine anywhere in the world is also using Containerd. Uh, but that's kind of just one aspect of how Containerd is used. We're also used by Kubernetes through the container runtime interface. And so our own cloud uh, is now moving to container D. Uh, this icon on the far right, the Kubernetes looking logo is, Go is Google's Kubernetes engine. They're also, they just announced this week that they're moving to container D from Docker. Alibaba, which is a huge cloud company in China, um, they have a project called Pouch Container, which uh, it was actually kind of funny. Someone said it was basically the Swiss Army knife of container. It does everything. Like, if you go look at this project on GitHub, it has like a Docker lookalike client. It has fancy registry features that don't exist in Docker, but it all uses Container D under the covers. Uh, and so they actually, Pouch Container has. Uh, the Alibaba team has contributors in Container D who are sending us fixes and, and changes that they're finding as they use it more and more. Uh, Bellina is a IoT focused version of the Mobi project. So again, I said Mobi is what becomes the Docker engine. Uh, Bellina did some really neat things for small constrained devices using less memory. When you do like a Docker pull, it only pulls the changes so like for very um, uh, low bandwidth networks, it, it works better for getting an updated image. Uh, so they also have Containerd running there. Uh, obviously the Docker client, Linux kit, 
we probably don't have time to unpack that tonight, but that's an interesting project that Docker created that actually is used to build the Docker for Mac pro product. It's a way to construct Linux images uh, in a very repeatable way. It uses container D as the runtime. Uh, Rancher has a project called Rio that uses container D. And Elliot is another IoT project that wanted a small runtime and they chose container D. Um, so again, uh, these are all uses, except for the Docker and Linux Kit logo, um, these are all uses where giving Container D to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation allowed a bunch of use cases to exist that may not have wanted to use all of Docker, but Container D fit um, what they wanted better than the full Docker engine. Um, let's just talk a few minutes about Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has never run containers. It's an orchestrator, but it's always needed a, a container runtime to do that. It's been using Docker for many, many years. Uh, but around the time that Rocket came out, so I mentioned CoreOS had this alternative uh, runtime, uh, people have tr been trying to get the kubelet, which is what runs on, a, on an actual single node uh, that, that needs to be able to talk to a runtime. They've been trying to make a way for it to um, be abstracted so it doesn't just know how to talk to Docker or Rocket, but anyone who implemented a API for the kubelet could be a runtime underneath Kubernetes. And so um, that, that layer is called the CRI, and I mentioned that's Container Runtime Interface. Um, so today, most clusters in the world running Kubernetes probably look something like on the left. There's a thing called Docker Shim that implements the CRI that calls Docker Engine, which again, because of everything we've talked about, actually calls Container D, which talks to shims, which call Run C. So that's kind of the stack today in a Kubernetes cluster of how containers actually get run on the system. So uh, the CRI plugin implementers were originally from Google. They came to us last fall and said, how about we just work together in the same project in open source, and so the CRI plugin and Containerd are just a single binary now that uh, if you install a Kubernetes cluster, uh, like an IBM Cloud or GKE, with the, both those clouds have Containerd support today, it'll look a lot more like on the right here. So Kubelet talks to the CRI plugin, which uses Containerd to start and stop and pause and, and do all the container lifecycle activity needed uh, for Kubernetes. And so uh, if you want to know more, there's a big blog post out about Kubernetes uh, CRI and Container D that came out this summer. And, uh, you know, this was kind of the, again, if you go all the way back to Container D start, this was always the end goal was to be able to have a runtime that was not as opinionated as the full Docker engine that could be used by both Docker and Kubernetes. And so this is kind of that result. Um, so at this point, we can go a lot of different directions. Uh, I can show a few things, which it sounds like that would be good uh, to kind of demo. And then other questions, which it sounds like we have a question to define namespaces. So maybe I'll start there, and then we'll figure out where to go from there. So if you think about a physical container, like an actual box that we put something in, um, this is actually all going to break as soon as they add another namespace namespace to um, Linux, which they're about to do. But at least for now, there's six of them, and it makes a perfect, like if you've ever seen a flat pack box, that thing on the left can actually fold up into what you see on the right. And so at the moment, um, there are exactly six namespaces in Linux, and they're all ways of isolating a process from, a, from basically information on the rest of the system. And so, PID stands for process ID. And so once I enter a PID namespace, then only processes I create are visible to me. So I can't see that there's an Apache web server running on my host or, or system D or so, any, any other process on the host are invisible to me. Same with the mount namespace. Once I enter a mount namespace and mount a file system, I can't see the rest of the host's files. I can't see any of the other file systems. 
So you can think of namespaces as a way to isolate a container from everything else on the system. These concepts, uh, what's messy about containers on Linux is all those concepts on the left came about at different times. There was no meeting where they sat down and said, let's make a thing called a container. These were all created by different Linux kernel maintainers over a period of a decade. Uh, the last one, I think, being the user namespace, which was like 2010, 2011. Um, so these, these ways of isolating processes has been around on Linux for a very long time. And the LXC project existed long before Docker, as well as some other attempts to make a container-like um, capability on top of Linux. So like really smart Linux kernel developers, they're always a little bit grumpy about Docker because they've been using some of these features for like a very, very long time. Um, but it was Docker that put this together in such a nice packaging that when you type Docker run and some image, it all just seems like magic because it's creating a mountain namespace and a PID namespace. It's doing all the hard work for you below, behind the scenes. Uh, and LXC does that too, but it had, it had so many knobs that a lot of people were kind of turned off by usability, whereas Docker kind of hid all that from you, for better or for worse. You, you didn't even have to know about these things to use Docker. Um, there's an analogous feature of Linux called control groups, shortened to just C groups. And that's, if you think about the box's size, that's ways to tell a process, you can only use a third of the CPU, or you can only use this much um, I.O. bandwidth to the disk or you can only use 256 meg of memory. And so cgroups plus namespaces gives you a way to fully control how, how a contained a process sees the world around them. Okay, yeah, yeah, so this, um, is that readable to everybody? Yeah. Um, so I just updated this system a few hours ago to 18.09, which is the Docker engine that just came out today. Um, so, I should see that there's some kind of Docker, oh, I have a container running, that makes it look ugly. Um, let me stop this. Um, I can't even use Docker anymore, I don't even know what I'm doing. Um, let's try this again. So. I have a Docker engine running, it's on PID 29307, so the Docker D, actually that's what I should have grepped for. Um, so I've got a Docker daemon running. I also better have container D running. Yep, user bin container D, that's PID 26158. And you won't find any run C processes because of what I talked about earlier. Even when I have a running container, run C is only shows up as a process very briefly while it sets up the namespaces, but I better have a run C binary. Um, actually, that's the wrong one. Uh, I, I have multiple because I develop container D, but um, in, in the Docker 1809 packaging, they now install a system run C and user sbin. Um, so that should have a reasonable recent date. So yeah, October 16th. So this is the run C that came in the new package. Uh, I think the package name is, uh, is that search for a file? Not status. That's a new package called containerd.io. Um, and I have to relearn this tool every time I use it. I want to just show the info. W? No, oh, that's not very helpful. I thought there was a way to show more. Anyway, so you can see that I have containerd 1.2.0 RC2 installed, and that's because today's Docker 18.09 release depends on a new package called containerd.io which inside that, when that was installed, put the container D binary there and the run C binary there. Um, and the, so the interesting thing is that if you're not running 18.09, um, you will have um, 
a run C and a container binary on your, I think in user bin, called docker-containerd and docker-run C. So Docker was kind of compartmentalizing in case you had another containerd or another run C, they were depending on their own version of it. And they were actually running, so when you started Docker, it was starting its own containerd, which that containerd was told, use this special docker-run C binary. Um, that's all changed with 18.09. There's a container D that's just running on the system. Docker, when it starts, says, oh, that's the container D I'm going to talk to when I need to start containers and drive run C. And so that's a new um, kind of sign of the maturity that we can now have a system-wide container D. It's not just special for Docker. That means I can install Kubernetes on this node, and I can tell it to use the same container D. And the cool thing about container D is that we created it with the, um, actually, let me sudo in here so I don't have to do that on every command. So CTR is our client for container D. So if I do CTR version, it's not going to match because I'm building my own locally. But you can see server version is because it talked to the um, version that just got installed with 18.09. So I can do CTR namespaces ls. So this is why namespaces is a horrible word. This is not, has nothing to do with the namespaces we just talked about, but Kubernetes has a concept of just administratively putting things in different buckets. And so namespaces is one way to do that. And so when I ask container D, show me your namespaces, there's one called Moby one called k8s.io, which is for Kubernetes, and one called default that's always there. And so if I do, um, let me restart Redis, Docker run, I'm gonna run it in the background, Redis. Um, now if I grab container D again, we're gonna find one of these shim, so I talked about container D has these shims which actually drive the run C process. And actually you can see that it told, um, we, we told run C where it was gonna find the files because it created a special directory for that. Um, so the container D shim is using this Moby namespace. Uh, and then of course there's a bunch of things about where that container is. Uh, but we better of course find that there is a Redis process running on this system. Sure enough, there's a Redis server at PID 474. So there's two ways I can look at this container. I can Docker PS. Yep, sure enough, I have a Redis container. It has an ID. It's been running for um, a minute. If I do container, if I ask container D, I'll type these commands out so you can see what I'm doing. To list containers, it says there's nothing. And that's because I haven't told it which namespace to look in, so it's looking in default but Docker is putting all of its containers in the Moby namespace. And so if I switch and say, tell me how many, you know, what containers are running in the Moby namespace, I get this long ID, which hopefully you should see matches what Docker thinks its ID is. And if I ask container D again, tell me about tasks, because we separate the concept of a container from a task that's actually running. It says, oh yeah, that container, has PID 474 that's running, and that matches this um, Redis instance I, I, I have. So uh, the scary part is that means now in container D, I could do something bad to this container, and Docker has to like figure out, um, you know, Docker's not expecting us to do management of the life cycle of a container outside of Docker. Um, so there are some new powers you get in this world uh, in fact, we've had bug reports, like I use run C to like kill a container and like it's not showing right in my Docker PS. And we're like, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, so th the, the intent of these layers is not that you can, you can mix and match, uh, but the intent of these layers are uh, that Docker can use container D and have all these containers and tasks under the Moby namespace. I can install Kubernetes and also be using the same container D and it would use that k8s.io namespace. And Docker and Kubernetes would happily use the same container D runtime without walking over each other. 
it's not, it's not uh, necessarily meant for that because, again, it's just an administrative property. There's no security built into namespaces. It's just a way of administratively kind of separating concerns. All right, well, thanks for hanging out. That was a long, long time. But... Yeah.